simulation. Um, um, yeah, no way about your simulation, yeah. but in general. <laughs> in general, I will select the path of ratio close to the zero point. But, but, how, but how would you, if, if, if someone told you that, this, that during the loading, the soil was undrained, or it was undrained loading of the soil, what does that tell you about what's going on in the soil? Well, why, why is it called undrained? Undrained means that uh, during the loading, the liquid will not uh, move out or entering the soil. That's right, so that's un undrained. And if it's fully saturated, um, then the water's got no time to go anywhere because the water's relatively incompressible, then this is another source of oscill oscillations it could be. Whereas if you load it very slowly, mm -hmm. of course the water then does have time to go out and come in. Yeah. And so the impact of the fluid is a lot less. Mm -hmm. um, in undrained loading then, um, in effective stress analysis, if you have an undrained loading of a saturated soil, mm -hmm. you get pore pressure changes. Yeah. And what other pore pressure changes do you to? I'm telling you what the pore pressure changes are due to doing undrained, yeah. undrained loading of a saturated soil. So during the undrained loading, when we apply the loading to the state the saturated soil again, because the water cannot uh, move out or entering the element so the in the beginning of the undrained loading, all the liquid will observe the loading, external loading. Okay. Therefore the pore water pressure is going up and and when the gradually when we have the consolidation when the liquid can move out mm -hmm. the element, we can have the water pressure, the excess pore water pressure will start to reduce. Yeah. 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 And so and so for the undrained part of loading before the water's the time to go anywhere, if the soil is saturated, what sort of volume changes would you get? So the volume change will be uh, zero. Yeah, uh, zero. Yeah, right. zero. So, so the pore pressure changes are, be, are because the volume changes is preventive. Yes. And if you if you have um, and if you do undrained loading of a soil and you and you do get some volume changes because your soil isn't fully saturated. Okay. Um, okay. So we, we we started talking about standard finite element analyses mm -hmm. and about the problems of the stress oscillations and the discontinuous stresses. So in a standard finite element analysis, a standard finite element analysis, how would you how do you think you would go about mitigating the effects of stress oscillation? How do you, you set up your, your finite element analysis to, so that the oscillations you've got in your mesh uh, uh, have, uh, have, a, have a relatively small impact on the results? Yeah, yeah. Let's say if we have an undrained materials, what I can do is we can uh, use the full mesh blocking. For example, there are some uh, methods method like F bar or E bar. Mm -hmm. or in the key literature okay. and for if the stress or the oscillation stems from the fact that we have the discontinuous of the gradient of the set functions mm -hmm. the element we can select the higher order of set function for example like quadratic or functions or okay. be supply functions but what yeah I mean, you, there are all these very things you can do I was thinking it's really something a bit simpler than that that, that basically, in, in your finite element analysis, you have to, for example, um, do numerical integration to perform, perform the stiff, to work out the stiffness of the element. Yeah. And um, you have to recover stresses at certain times as well to check to check the things that you put for various things in your work them. So, is there anything you can do to to minimize minimize the impact of the stress oscillations? For when you recover the stresses and for when you do the numerical integration, what do, what do people tend to do in standard finite element analysis? I think it's uh, for the stress 
process of integration became uh, I think one of the solutions I think is to start to can increase all the polynomials for the state function and now we will get a better stresses. Well where would you I mean, if you're doing a standard finite element analysis, where, where in an element would you, would you sample the stresses? Um, what locations would you sample the stresses? These are integration points. And what, what would you choose for the integration points? So, now we I will choose the fully integrated element to avoid the stress oscillation. Alright, so would you use Gaussian integration? Yes. But why would you use Gauss integration? I think the Gauss, inter uh, Gauss integration because uh, you can get the exact integration for the, the function. And, and so, far as if, so far as just recovering the stress field is concerned, why would you use the Gauss points for that? Uh, so I think it's... Uh, so, for example, if you take an eight-node quadrilateral element, finite element, um, you know, you'll have a parabolic stress variation across the element. People will often use the reduced two by two Gaussian integration to sample the stresses. Why would why do they do that? I think now is because of the integrated element will more severe for the stress oscillation than the fully integrated. But if you sample at the reduced integration points, for example, I've just told you, then what people are finding is you get the right solution. So, so these integration points, these Gaussian points, you can be various in other element type to element type, but these locations are the optimal locations to recover your stresses and to perform the numerical integration. Yeah. So that's why people use them. Okay. So this is why people like using Gaussian integration, because they're the optimal locations. Mm. And, uh, um, I suppose the reason I've highlighted that these are the optimal locations is for obvious reasons when we go on to the material point method. Yeah. So, so um, because you have you have done something different, obviously, to 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 this traditional form of finite element analysis, which which we we, we start talking about, and you use the variants of the finite element method called material point method in order to avoid excessive distortion of the elements that can occur with the standard finite elements um, when analyzing problems involving large deformations. And so can you explain in very simple terms um, in what ways the material point method differs from the standard finite element method? Yeah, I think for the people who, who are familiar with the finite element method, we can say that in the material point method, we do not fix the integration point inside the element, but we uh, let the integration point moving freely in the background. Bit. So it depends on where in the integration point in the background bit, you will perform the integration using the CFR interpolation. And this, uh, this integration is on the first order accurate. Therefore, the accuracy of the material point method is uh, lower than the finite element method when you have the small informations. So. Okay, so, so basically in the material point method, the mesh essentially remains in position. Doesn't the background, background mesh or the grid that you, that, you, that you use to perform your calculations, that remains in position. Yeah, both. So we may unchanged during yeah. the simulation. It remains unchanged and material points move through um, the mesh. Yes. And the thing is that in the material point method, you're sampling integration points are the material points, aren't they? Yes. Okay. Which are obviously not the optimal locations yes. as people use in the standard fire type method. Yes. And this is where a lot of the problems come about in the material point method these non-optimal locations to sample the stresses and to do the numerical integration. Yeah. And of course you have problems with material points moving from one element to another element mm -hmm. and all this other thing. So it's really a very challenging thing yeah. um, that you've been, you've been looking at. Now in your thesis, um, you refer to MPM, material point method, 
as a meshless or mesh free method. Um, but aren't these two different approaches? Um, what do you understand by, by meshless methods? And what do you understand by a mesh free method? Okay. To my understanding, mesh meshless method means that we do not have a mesh uh, for um, to help you to the simulations. For example, we can think about the smooth uh, hypermechanic SPH mm -hmm. or like uh, but for the mesh free method, I think it's more like we have the mesh, mm -hmm. but the mesh is not is restricted by the compatible equations. So basically like in the free phase method like finite element method, we have to uh, put some condition to make sure that we do not have the overlap or discontinuous of the element because we based on the continuum mechanics. However, however some mesh free method the element is freely moving and do not be restricted by the continuum conditions. Yeah. yeah. So that is a the thing is like people still uh, it's difficult to uh, classify whether material or method is the mesh free or mesh is because right. okay. we have the mesh but we still within the continuum. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, so um, um, as, as we've already said, but it's as in finite element method, um, <coughs> the sample the stresses and um, perform numeric integration. Um, it's not done at the Gauss points in the material point method. Um, it's used using the material points, and this leads to various problems because you're not using the optimal lo locations. Um, in your experience, how big can these problems be, and how do we, do you attempt to overcome? Does does using methods such as GIMP, which you talk about in the other in the chapter? Three, I think, is in your thesis. Yeah. Do do methods such as GIMP solve the problem? Yeah. 